Most gnomes never leave the burrow. And here I am confronted by more difference every day than Markin sees in a lifetime, Lorian said. That's what you are then, a gnome. I thought you were some kind of weird pink goblin, Snark said. Snark! Regina slapped the goblin lightly on the back of his head. I apologise for my friend. It would appear sometimes that he was raised in a cave. I was. Perfectly normal for a goblin, that. Tracy Gregory, how are things in South Wales? Good, Graham. Yeah. Yeah, great. And you still... Is Cardiff? You haven't yes, moved? Yeah. Still in Cardiff? Moved, yeah. Are you born and bred there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's handy then. That's a that's a great life for an author. You don't have to move. That's what I like about doing audiobooks, as you know, is the fact that you can do it all from home. And how is life as a full-time author? Because when we first spoke uh, 14 books ago, because this is the uh, Eternal Dungeon, while, is the yeah. 15th, yeah, 14 books ago when we first spoke, you, were, you still did have a day job. It was actually a good day job too. Um, but then you turned full time, I think, after about the first three we'd done. I know you've done other books as well. So, how is life as a full time author? Uh, it's hard to complain, <laughs> honestly. You know, I get to do every day what a lot of people dream about. So, I, you know, I'm very lucky in that. Is there a challenge to it, though? Because uh, you make be. your own structure. Yeah, making your own structure means that you have to enforce your own structure, which means there's nobody else to blame if something goes wrong or you're not on time or, you know, it's, you've got to take that into account. But no, it is, you know, I'm, I'm quite blessed to do what I do every day. I'm, yeah, with uh, freedom comes great responsibility. Yeah, it does, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, as I said, this is the 15th book that we've, that, that you've written that I've narrated and I think this may well be my favourite. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I'm now really used to your writing style now. So I really, really enjoy reading them. And th there's just something about this one that has elements of the previous ones. Like there's a lot of Goblin Summoner in it, I think. But there is, you know, there's there's the fish out of water stuff of um, Kaiju. And it, it's, got, it's got so much. It's a real you book. And 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 I just love it. Tell me about how this one came about then. Well, it, it came about um, just from like a, a kind of a very base, basic, not basic, very straightforward idea. A lot of the kind of the, the genre I write in the RPG features a lot of large, expansive dungeons because that's kind of a fantasy trope at this point. And it was more like, well, if there was a dungeon, they, they tend to functionally go on forever. What would that be like? Because it would have to be its own encapsulated kind of ecosystem almost mm. right it'd have to have things in place that allowed it to work and allowed it to you gotta feed kind of people exist and, and yeah, was, yeah 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 and kind of the idea was kind of exploring then what does that look like you know if you if you need to have people living in this place then you need to also then somehow provide them with like food and water and building supplies but then what does that look like in whoever put this place together isn't necessarily the sanest person in the universe <laughs> so we're kind of what how does that spiral out? It was just a lot of fun, just kind of playing with the idea. You mentioned it was it's lit LPG, no lit RPG. LPG yeah. is liquid petroleum gas. That's very different. Lit RPG <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know what that phrase means or is even scared of it. And you know, it, full disclosure, when I did the first book, which was the Goblin Summoner book with no, when I did the first Goblin Summoner book with you, we'd done one before, hadn't we? We did uh, Star Commander. Yes. We, we, yeah. 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 But uh, when we did the first uh, Goblin Summoner book together, I didn't know what lit RPG was. And it did scare me a little bit because I'm like, I don't know, you know, this is a real genre. The people who are really into this are really into this. And I'm coming at it new, but I've got to own it because I'm narrating it. But it really is. Um, it's a very simple concept. It's based on, on card games and a point system, isn't it? So anyone who's not familiar with the genre seeing lit RPG shouldn't shouldn't really put them off at all. No, no, it's kind of a, it's a subgenre of kind of fantasy and science fiction where certain things that the characters do and go through is, is quantified in some way. There's some kind of underlying system underpinning all of their like abilities and things like that. And like a lot of fantasy is very hand -wavy. How did they do that? Well, it's magic. RPG tends to be, yeah, but how does that work? Is there is there some kind of like fundamental system to it? And a lot of it is inspired and based by video games, right? It's kind of a natural shifting of things that people like in that sliding into 
literature and, and writing but the people who like it do tend to really like it because it de- definitely tickles that kind of analytical part of your brain right yeah it places limits on the characters ability yes, as well yeah. with their skills which is always artistically to have limits is always good you know it, yeah. it forces more creativity it, yeah, yeah that's right yeah you know when, when you know that well they can't you know for a fact the character can't do x and the readers know that because they're given that information um it, it does force you to come up with new and creative things and kind of create situations that you maybe wouldn't see in other kind of stories and things and i think that's the fun of it right you get like just odd not odd but like unique scenarios and the ways out of it and kind of puzzling that through with the characters is a lot of fun i think for some people because yeah. again if they know people know well the characters can do this these specific things how would i get out of it if i knew i could do these specific things and does that line up with what happens i think a lot of people find find that quite yeah. satisfying as well yeah and in this one like the others the the score and the rules and everything are are given to the characters in written form but what i liked about this one is the characters can interact with yeah. the written instructions and they can disagree and question yeah yeah i wanted yeah. to give the kind of you get the standard kind of you're right kind of notifications things i wanted to give that a bit of a personality that's if it right. is something it's an extra is, character yeah yeah because yeah, if it is something that is functionally running this system for everybody who's in this dungeon the dungeon is functionally infinite so it could be potentially you know billions of people or whatever it, it's going to develop quirks right it's not going to just be <laughs> even if even if it was say a computer it's not it's like a magical thing but if it were like a computer it would start getting questions asked to it and the replies it gives it would develop a personality over time and i wanted to include that yeah kind of in and the we story. should say we should say once again you know as, as you mentioned earlier people's image of a dungeon is of a small dark place and this is of a vast it's really a, an another world isn't it really yeah in effect. yeah essentially yeah it's like a like a labyrinth almost but it's just one of such vast size and scale that it is like an entire other world kind of yeah. contained within stone walls that yeah just can change and constantly shift and added to of, yeah yeah and the good thing is we see this world the, of the Eternal Dungeon through the eyes of Jackson, who is a regular 20th century Earth-based flawed human who finds himself in this world so we can relate to what he's going through, which I thought was very... I know it's a, it's something you've done in, in the other books as well, but it's very, very clever because it makes it very, very, very relatable. You feel his frustration at times and 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 uh, sometimes when he just doesn't understand and and also his little victories when when he does really well in this world which he's not he, he's not experienced in but he manages to to battle his way through somehow it's great yeah and i i, I enjoyed writing this one because because jackson as a character is quite a bit more kind of uh acerbic than kind of the other characters i've written he's more matter of fact and he will tell you kind of what he means up front right he's not as softly spoken as some of the characters and things like that and yeah. he, especially because the way he kind of why it happens in the story and the way he's set up, he's not set up for success in the dungeon <laughs> no. in any way. No, he's, he's not. Although he, he does end up with with quite the ability. I don't want to give too much away, but there is a, a particular ability. I don't know if I'm using the right word there, but he has a particular yeah. skill. That, and, and I don't know how how much you want to give it away, which you would think would be quite useful, but it turns out to be not as useful as maybe you would expect. <laughs> Yeah, it's a skill that the, the idea of it is that it's something that if you had a dungeon that had an infinite amount of monsters and it would make a lot of sense yes. to, for those monsters, you know, the general kind of everyday monsters to have that ability. And it sounds like all upside. And then there's actually, no, there's quite a lot of downside to it because it's not it's not a pleasant thing. And, it you know, it's not as straightforward as you would think. Once and again, kind of, there are limits and rules yeah, to it. Yeah, there are limits. And again, it's which... playing with those limits and seeing how they impact things is, is quite interesting. And as a writer, did that help you write some scenes? Because, like I said, I don't want to give away what the skill is, but it's a skill where if you were writing a scene where something happened to this character, it would kind of end the scene kind of thing and change the book. But this gives you more scope to keep going. Yeah. And did, and and did that help you, you as a writer? It does. And I think it means that you could kind of keep the stakes to a certain level. Um and kind of play with the idea of the ability a bit in that yeah, things can happen to this character that couldn't happen to any other 
character in any other book because the book would be short let's be yes. honest so yeah, yeah. it gives you that kind of option of well you get to play with it you get to have fun with it you get to kind of see where you can go or kind of change things in an unexpected way like i said it is it is a lot of fun especially with the way i write where i don't tend to pre-plan any of the books you just kind of go with it and it gives you the chance to kind of we'll veer off into something else interesting and then we'll try a way to loop that back in later so that it it all fits together naturally is that it? So the story's telling itself to you as you go yeah. along. You don't map it all out with a no, no. A lot of kind of a lot of writers do. A lot of writers yeah. don't. It's it's a very personal thing and how you do it. For me, as I write the book, a story is, is happening to me. It's the first time. It's the same yeah. as anybody would be to reading it. Yeah. And then also once you've written that, you go back and you make tweaks and things and changes. So it, it kind of flows more naturally as a story and you can do foreshadowing and things like that oh i but see first, right. so yeah. if, some, if something as you get to it you go oh if only this happened then you can go back and put you can that go in back and make... add it yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah but you kind right. of, as you go through it yeah that kind of you kind of discover it and i think it for me i find that leads to a more natural story um yeah. if i was to try and plan it out i th- i feel like especially because the way i know i am it wouldn't it wouldn't feel natural because you'd be like oh i've got to get from point a to point b yeah and you, rather than well, I've got point A, and we'll just see what happens, and yeah. you know, down the line, yeah. and then you make something point B that happens, and it feels the way I write, it feels like a more natural story. You know what I mean? Like a like, like a thing that could happen, not a plot that was devised by someone. Yeah, yeah, and that you have to be slavishly loyal to. Yeah, exactly. You've got the yeah. freedom to to go off if you want, because I suppose if you go off in a direction and it doesn't really go anywhere, you just get rid of those couple of chapters yeah, and exactly. go back to where it was working. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've got total yeah. freedom because you're in you're in control of the whole thing. I get that in a small way. I I you know I'm not a writer, but you know I was a breakfast radio presenter for a long time and i liked to go in with a lot of ideas each morning of things to talk about but not know exactly what we were going to do with it and i was forever coming up against management who by the way had never done a successful breakfast radio show who would want everything planned out and would want me to show them the plan and i could go no i can give you a list of about 12 things that we're going to touch on but I can't tell you what time we'll do them or, or how long we'll go with each one. But if the phones are going good, we might just stay on that one all morning. You know what I mean? Oh, it drove them crazy. Drove them. You've got to. So you've got to follow the ball, haven't you? Like in football, yeah. you know, you've got to follow it, and and uh, that must be actually quite satisfying to have the story lead you into places as well. Yeah. You mentioned the characters. Now, I would say the char- one of the reasons why I love this book is I love, love, love the characters. They are the best you've written so far that I've worked on. You may have written better stuff, better characters on books I haven't worked on, but of the ones I've narrated, these are hands down the best. And I do have a favourite. And I'll explain why right now. What I do when I do your books, all audio books, is when a character makes the first appearance... I take, I do the line and I have a few goes at it until I go, yeah, that's what I'm happy with. And sometimes I'll do what you do. I'll go a few chapters in and go, I don't like them. And I'll go back and change every line, three, four, five, six, seven, up to 10 chapters back and change them just to make them just when, when I think I've found it, I know them a bit better, but I will then, rec- I'll then record into a, cause I have a folder, Google drive folder for each book I'm working on. And then I have one subfolder, which is called voices. And that's the voices of those characters. So that when a character comes up who may be disappeared for a few chapters and then returns, I want them to be consistent i can go back to that folder and listen to a bit of them and snark is just the greatest um every time i went back to his little voice thing i got him perfectly and i think this is actually if it's not the first line he says it's the second or third because i always pick the first line or maybe one, or if that one doesn't really define them if that's just a single word or something i'll pick one that really does define them. I'm going to play it to you now. This is every time he came up towards the beginning, towards the end of the book, I just had him and I just went for it. But this this is what I heard. Who's there? I know you're hiding, you little shit. And that, just just that, that, that first of all, it's got his curiosity and suspicion, but then that real negative edge he had yeah, to him. Yeah, Where yeah. did he come from? I love him. I don't know, it's just the idea that he's just a very... Um kind of he's in a bad situation and yet somehow he still finds a way to kind of 
have a go at it more than it already is. Like he's quite, a, he's not he's not a positive person. But he... No, and it's not helping him. It's not bringing him happiness. His the way he's dealing with it is not making things any better for him or anyone else around him. No, but I think for <laughs> for Snark specifically, you get it kind of touches on it later in the book. But for him and the kind of the the people he's from, because every every character is from a different world originally mm. like he's he's a goblin and they're not treated particularly well where he comes from so i think it's like a defensive thing more than mm. anything else that's his he's learned to be like that because he's learned not to trust humans <laughs> he comes across or, or anybody else right that it's quite a, a rough life that he's had previously and i think that would that would kind of do that to you right you would you wouldn't be very trusting and you wouldn't be very upbeat and you would be willing to be a little bit harsh and aggressive when needs be because you have you've had to do survive previously mm. right like and now he's in an entirely different setting with no idea what's going on as much as anybody else but he's still kind of got that edge about him that kind of carries him through a bit like he, he is he is how he is but it does it does put him in good stead sometimes like it definitely works for him, for him specifically yeah I suppose it's for the same reason why the the dogs that are the yappier dogs are the smaller breeds and the bigger dogs yeah. seem to be more chilled out. And it has to be that way or there would be no small dogs. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's just a learned thing through evolution. And that's what that's what's put him there. And for him, because he swears the most in the book. Yes, yeah. His swearing defines his character as well because it, it gives that edge of aggression but also a vulnerability to him <laughs> that, you know, that he's backed into a wall and this is the only way he, he's, he can express himself because he is just such an angry little bugger. Um, this book, although he swears the most, is the first one that I've narrated of yours that has, shall we say, zesty language. This is not yeah. a kid's book. Um, why, why the change in this one? Well, I've always kind of thought about like like a lot of my books I, I write them as though they were written for like a, a particular audience and, and most of the people who read the books are adults but i wanted to be like if it's something they wanted to share with their their kids or whatever they could right mm -hmm. i always thought was, well this might be dad's book but if he puts the audiobook on in the car he wants to know it's okay right yes i, I think just just with this one that the situation the characters find themselves in is just so much more desperate than some some of my other books that it, it was almost a necessity. Yes. Right? Like, like Gareth in Goblin Summoner, yeah, he's sent to another world, but he's sent to a place that's initially largely quite pleasant. Do you know what I mean? It's rolling hills and medieval cities and, you, you know, people who can help him. It's not it's not the end of his life, is it? This, it's you're essentially in an infinite prison. Yes. Right? Yeah. You, you're not, it's not a nice place and it's not a nice thing to be doing and nobody is trying to help you. And it's much more of a kind of book about survival. And I think yes. that that is how people would react more. And so not including that, I think, would have made it feel kind of inauthentic to the, the characters and the situation that they're in. Yeah, I think the characters are, uh, well, particularly Jackson, is challenged uh, more. The environment challenges him more often in, in, in other books with, with Gareth in Goblin Summoner is because the environment changes so rapidly because it's a it's a set of different environments that are interconnected. So yeah. he has to travel between them because it has to be that way to make the dungeon work, as you mentioned earlier. With it needs all the other infrastructure to, to, to. It's not like a. It's not like where it is a world where there are different lands. This is like the next room is another yeah. world. So he's got to be able to get that, and you're getting. I think the the frustration of the characters comes through. Um, better with the language in some cases certainly for snark and, and when jackson gets a bit to the end of his turn <laughs> as yeah. well you know he's there there's no doubt and it makes it more real and uh, a little bit more connected i thought i, I thought it was refreshing um uh, to, to to it was a surprise you know when i got the the manuscript i was like hello hello what's going on but then uh but it's just a fabulous book it's great yeah and how did you find the process of turning this one into an audio book? Oh, brilliant as always. <laughs> you know, if anybody wants an audio book done, I very much recommend Graham. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a great book. Fabulous monsters and ogres. Great characters. Great story. Really funny in parts, as all of your stuff is. There is a, there is a, um, a twinkle in the eye in the humour that you add to these stories, which I'm sure some people who write this kind of thing might take them a little bit too seriously. But you never do. You always, you always have a warmth in there. They're not. You know, even no, no matter what happens, I never get the feeling it's it's been written in a mean spirited way. It's like, eh, see what it, it was always like, oh, what can this do? What can what can we do? What can we do with it? Yeah. It's just playful. Um, I, I found, and and that's one of the reasons why I like your stuff. But this one, this this one is is. Is gonna is it's one of my favorites. It's it's I, I like the original Goblin Summoner series a lot, a lot, um, and this one, although this is only one book and that's a series, so you can't compare the two just yet. I know this will be a series, won't it? Because this yes. is book one. Yeah. yeah. When when it's when it's a, a series, I'm sure I'll be hard pushed to to separate them, but they will be number one and number two so far. But who knows? You might be doing some crazy other stuff. Uh, it is, it is wonderful. It's called The Eternal Dungeon. It's a lit RPG. It's by Tracy Gregory. What's next for you? Oh, at the moment, I'm working on the, the newest Goblin Summoner book. Great. Um, and then once that's finished, uh, it will probably be the sequel to this. It'll be the next. Oh, we'll next get, we don't have to wait too long, eh? Don't not that. Hopefully not. No. There are links in the description to The Eternal Dungeon. Check them out if you're watching on YouTube. If you're not watching on YouTube, if you're watching on, you know, if this is embedded or something, just check, look out for this uh, this video on YouTube. And all the links are there to Amazon so you can download them. It's fabulous. It's the Eternal Dungeon. Always good to talk to you, Tracy. Continued success. Have a good day, Graham.